Hey guys, welcome to Urology Biology. Now on this episode, it has finally happened. I can't believe it either, but I finally got a Rolex on the channel. Uh, and this one caused me a lot of stress. This is the Rolex Air King from 1964 with a reference, which is a little bit shady, 1002. And I'm going to explain exactly why I'm saying that later on in the video. I received this watch a few weeks ago and oof, man, what an absolute headache. Seriously, whoever worked on this movement before, I would like 10 minutes with them in a private room with no cameras, no police, no security. And I would like to have some stiff words about some of the things that I found inside this movement, which you guys are going to see later on in the video. So as usual, I am going to strip this watch down. I'm going to fully break all the parts down to the core elements. I'm going to clean everything. I'm going to rebuild it, oil it and regulate it and get it back up into a tip top condition. Now, as you can see, the handset of this has got some serious play. And of course, you know exactly what that's going to mean later on. Yes, I am going to have to make some adjustments, which is not fresh, but it is what it is. So let's get on with the strip down of this Rolex Air King from the mid 1960s. Now, from my understanding, and I am not a big Rolex guy, as you guys know already. From my understanding, the reference number for the Air King was the 5500 and not the 1002. The 1002 is the Oyster Perpetual from the same era. The other thing as well is the movement inside is coming up as the 1560, which also I was surprised to see which is another indication that what we have here, unfortunately, is a marriage watch. Now, if I'm completely wrong about this, please let me know, because I'm sure there are so many more of you out there that know much more about Rolex watches than I certainly do. But from my research, the thing that I've actually taken from this is that somewhere along the line of the journey of this watch, the dial has been swapped and an Air King dial has been put in in its place because the movement and the case full reference number corresponds to a Rolex Oyster Perpetual and not an Air King. So that is my suspicions in regards to this particular watch that I'm working on right now. Again, if you guys know more about it than me, which I'm sure you do, please let me know in the comments. So I've basically removed the hands from the watch, obviously removed the uh, movement from the case, and I'm just gently removing the dial. And the dial's actually in really nice condition. Looks really nice, all shiny, blue, crispy, and gonna look even better later on when I polish up that crystal. Now, after removing the dial, I see my first major problem, and one I'm not happy about, glue. Now, somewhere along the line, somebody has obviously broken the shock lever to that lower jewel setting for the balance, and instead of replacing it, which is the right thing to do, no sir, they decided it would be more logical just to put a big glob of glue on it and let my ass deal with it 20 years later down the line. Not fresh, but here we are. So I flipped the movement over and I'm going to now remove the automatic works for the Rolex. Now that's held in with the three screws, those blue screws as you can see. And from my understanding as well, the blue screws indicated, it's more of an indication, so you know that those are to do with the automatic works and not the trains. Because one of the screws actually pokes through. So I've removed the automatic works and there's a lot of crud on this watch. I mean, it's obviously not been serviced for a very long time. It's very dirty. There's a lot of staining, which really has been quite difficult to actually get off, if I'm honest. So removing off the little bridge and then underneath you've got the two reversing wheels and then another driving wheel. And the condition of them are actually not too bad. And the functionality of the watch was actually working. So the watch was working when I got it. It's not that it was a non-runner or anything like that. It wasn't running very well, but it was actually running and that's a very good sign. So just dismantling these two reversing wheels, and I must admit, I do like the nice color of these. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a huge Rolex fan, as you guys know, but I do like the special nice red color to those wheels. I think it's a nice touch, nice unique touch, and uh, anybody who knows anything about Rolex or doesn't can kind of easily identify them by those wheels. It's a nice touch. Now, the other thing as well, which I was quite taken by, and it's not something that you see very often, is this little lever which basically sits on, type, on top of the hairspring. And what they call it is, it's to protect the hairspring. To be honest, I actually thought it was an absolute pain in the ass because every time I kept putting in the balance, I had to make sure that I removed this lever out of the way because if you pull it up, you're going to twang on your hairspring as I did a couple of times because it's not often that you see those uh, hairspring protectors. And to be honest, 
Yeah, is it necessary? No, I don't think so. It is an old Breguet hairspring, it's an overcoil, so it's not a flat hairspring, you'll see that as well later on. But I thought, yeah, it's a little bit overkill, let's say, in my opinion. And to be honest, working on it, it was a little bit of a pain in the ass having to remember that it's there all the time as well. So, again, I have to move it back into its position because I don't want to break it. Now, recently I dropped a post in the community tab giving some updates about the channel. Now, the first thing I was going to say is I am going to do another giveaway and this time I'm giving away something expensive. I am giving away the Roma Stingray Chrono with the famous Valju 72 movement inside. Now this watch estimates around the $2,000 mark and I'm going to give this away to one lucky subscriber of the channel once we hit 100,000 subscribers. Now I know a lot of you are going to be sitting back and going, hey HB man, 100,000 subscribers? That's a lot of number. It is. But it's a lot of watch. And I'm prepared to give it away to one of you guys once we hit that number. If we could hit that before the end of 2024, I would be over the moon. So, all you gotta do is like and subscribe to be in with a shot. Now the other thing as well that I wanted to mention is moving forward with my videos for the members of the channel and the paid Patreons, I am gonna be uploading all of the unedited footage for my videos in all its long, full, extended glory for you guys to check out. Now, these videos are not going to have any audio to them, but they're literally just going to be a case of you see what I see, how I deal with it. And some of the videos you're going to have to skip along, obviously, because I go for toilet breaks and things like that. But basically, you're going to have access to what I see. So you're probably going to find it beneficial if you're working on a similar movement yourself. So back onto the Rolex, I have removed the motion works and I've removed the barrel bridge. Checked for play with the arbor and it was pretty good. No real problems with that. Kind of happy. Taking out the barrel and then of course I flipped the moment over and look at the play. Oh man, I'm going to get to that later on, but I had to basically deal with that. Some serious, serious amount of play. And given the way that the hands were moving at the beginning of the video when I was first checking the watch, I knew it was going to be bad, but I didn't think it was going to be as bad as this. Somebody has given a real go on this and really made a balls up of it. The metal is a little bit bent and if I'm honest, I do have my concerns. Removing the train of wheels and the wheels are in pretty good condition, so I'm quite happy with that. They're obviously going to get a clean and I can put those to one side obviously for later on. Removing the setting lever screw and taking out the winding stem. So I flip the movement over and I can take off the setting lever spring and break down the keyless works. Off goes the minute wheel. And then I can remove the intermediate wheel as well. Taking out the yoke spring and then I can take out the yoke. And this movement, unfortunately, has definitely been abused. It's really sad. Really, really sad that things like this happen. But look at this, guys. This is seriously giving me a big concern. Quite simply because it's really not been done in a really good fashion. It looks like it's been butchered. It's not even a perfect circle. There is so much play there. And the other thing, I don't know if you noticed on the video, you don't actually have a lot of room to work with, which is a big concern moving forward. Special shout to all the HB members and the Patreons of the channel. All your names are up on the screen right now. Thank you so much, all of you, for supporting the channel. If you want to become a HB member, there is information on that on the description page of my channel. And of course, there are links as well to the Patreon site. Thank you so much. Now the movement has all been pre-cleaned by pegging all of the jewels out with some peg wood and I've just put the balance back on and once again I can move that protection lever back into place. Also going to pre-clean the automatic works and I'm just removing the rotor from the bridge and then just pegging it out and as you can see it's quite a bit of crud. Also removing the old gaskets from the case and I'm going to remove the bezel as well with a case knife. I'm also going to give the crystal a quick buffing as well. It's not in terrible condition, I'm thankful to see. 
So I can just clean that up with some Plexi Revive later on. Now before I ultrasonic this, I just want to remove some of this crud with some peg wood, as you can see. Uh, you can do this quite easily. It's easier as well if you leave the harder stuff on until once you've cleaned it with the ultrasonic. As it'll come off a lot easier than afterwards, and then you'll have to clean it again with the ultrasonic cleaner. And there we have it guys, the movement completely stripped down and now cleaned. So of course, we can get on with the full rebuild of this video. So as always, I like to tackle the capstones of the balance. Now I just opened up the shock lever and I'm going to remove the capstones from the movement. I'm going to give these also a clean and clean off any old oil with some pegwood and some clean it up with some rodico and then some one dip as well. And then I can oil the capstone with some 9010 and pop it back all together. I also apply some fixer drop treatment before I oil it though. This will help the oil not run away from itself when you do oil it because you're working with such a small area and precision is key. Small amount of oil in the middle as you can see with some 9010 and then I will just put the capstones back together. Offer it back to the watch, drop it into place and close the shock system. Now you repeat the process exactly the same on the dial side, but of course, in our situation, that's not going to work. No sir, it's not. Because ours was glued together and it's completely screwed. So the entire piece will need to be replaced. And guys, this was not cheap. I tracked down a complete shock system with Joule in the US and it came in at $175 for this original Rolex part. Very, very expensive. Now watch this, this was funny. I would not be able to do this again if I tried. I literally shooted and I scored. Cannot believe I got it in the hole. The odds of it, <laughs> it's not normal. Oh, it was funny. So the first thing what you want to do is you want to basically measure everything up and make sure everything's flat and it's not working on this bridge. So what I decided to do is I decided to put the pallet cock on so that I would have a flat surface to work through. So when I'm driving in this new piece, as you can see now with a staking set, it's flat on the other side because obviously I don't want to damage and bend the bridge. Now you simply offer to this with a correct size stake, which is going to fit. And then you just slowly tap this in with your hammer. Now, once you've got it in place, the odds that you have got it in exactly right are going to be, mm, yeah, it's just not going to happen. So what you need to do now is put your balance back onto the movement and you're going to need to check for play, whether it's too tight or if it's too loose. If it's too tight, the balance is not going to fully turn, which is exactly the case, as you can see here. It's too tight the minute that I fully tighten the screw. So by putting it back onto the staking block and reversing your steps by tapping it in the opposite direction, you're going to lower it a little bit so that your balance is going to be free, which is exactly what I've done right now. I think it took me about two or three attempts. I cannot remember off the top of my head, but you want to basically check that you've got not too much play, but all the so at the same time, you don't want to be too tight, which is exactly what I did. And I'm really happy with the end results. Now for the center wheel adjustment hole, this one gave me a big challenge and I was quite worried about it because there's not a lot of metal to work with. As you can see, it's not completely sealed on the movement. You've got that hole on the side. Now by using a rounded stake, you can basically move the metal of the hole inwards to make it more smaller, which is what I did. And as you can see, the center wheel will not fully now fit into the hole. After you've done that, you can use a brooch, which will basically remove a little bit of metal and smooth it out so that the center wheel can then fit. I apologize for the blurred footage, but I didn't notice it until afterwards. Now the end results were okay, but not perfect. And to be honest, I think it was actually better than what I expected, quite simply because of how it had been butchered so much. And the dinting within the main plate was that bad as you could see. Yeah, I was really, really worried about how it was going to come out. So continuing with the rebuild, I have put in a brand new mainspring into the barrel. 
As you could see, I chrono greased the outer wall of it, being an automatic, and I've popped in the brand new mainspring. Adding a little bit of 1300 oil onto the side of the arbor, and then I can close the barrel lid onto the barrel, and then that's good to go. Now the other thing what I'm doing here is that I always do this, but I never show it. I use a pin vise, I grab the end of the arbor, and I just want to check that everything is basically turning. I want to feel the friction of the spring. Uh, before I put it all and build it up into the watch. And I don't think I've actually shown that before on the videos, but it's something that I always do. So building up the train of wheels now, and offering all of the wheels to the main plate, adding a little bit of 1300 as well for the center wheel and also for where the arbor of the mainspring barrel will go. And of course, also where the setting lever screw is, which I've just popped in. Once everything's in place, I can offer on the train of wheels bridge. Just gently lower that on, make sure that all your pivots are aligned. And then once it is, you can screw everything down correctly. In goes the mainspring barrel. And then I can just make sure that everything's engaging, which it is nice and smooth. And then I can put on the barrel bridge just offering it up to the movement and then just pressing everything down into place and then screwing it in. Again, checking that everything is engaged once it's all screwed down. So building up the crown wheel, there are now there's three pieces to this. You've got that bottom plate, so to speak, and then you've got the crown wheel and then you've got the crown wheel core as well. I'm adding a little bit of 1300 oil just to the wall of the crown wheel before I put on the crown wheel core. And then that's screwed in with the two screws, as you can see. Again, checking for engagement. Little 1300 to the arbor and also for where the click is going to go as well. And then I can put in the click spring. Just holding it down as well so it doesn't fly away from me. And then that's just held in with the one screw. Next, I can put on the ratchet wheel, which is this nice brass colored one, as you can see. And that's just held in with the one large screw on the top. Now, oiling up the train of wheels, I'm using a combination of 90-10, and then for the center wheel, I'm using uh, 1300. Flip the movement over because I need to remove these two little shock settings uh, for the escape wheel. Uh, there's one on each side, and then I can use 90-10 on the capstone, flip it back over and offer it again to the movement. Just drop it into place and then you'll see the little bit of oil bubble up on top, which did pretty nicely. And then I can close the shock setting. And of course, repeat the process on the other side as well, guys. And that's what you want to see, that really nice little bubble of central oil. Uh, definitely a good thing to see. Continue with the oiling as well on the dial side, same as the others. So 90, 10, 1300 on the middle. And then I'm adding a little bit of uh, grease for where the cannon pinion is going to go. It's friction fit, so you simply just snap that on with your tweezers. And then I'm just checking for its engagement. Movement flipped over now, and now I can deal with the pallet forks. Add in some fixer drop to these, and then what I also do is, once I've removed them, I will remove any of the fixer drop from the pivots. This, do not skip this step. Fixer drop will create drag. Drag is friction, and friction decreases your amplitude, which is obviously not what you want. So make sure that you do that. Again, having to deal with this pesky... Um, protection spring, seriously. And then I can add in the pallet cock, held in with the one screw, and then just nip that up. 
Mud in a little bit of wind into the movement via the ratchet wheel then, I just used a screwdriver. And of course now I can just add a little bit of oil to the exit stone of the pallet forks. And then just making sure that all of the teeth of the escape wheel receive a nice little dab of oil. And we're getting close to the end of the build of this watch. And guys, it did take me quite a long time, considering what you've seen I've actually gone through, which has been quite a lot. So building up the keyless works, setting lever screw and uh, setting lever is in, also adding the crown with the winding stem into the sliding pinion and the winding pinion, and then adding up a little bit of grease and using a combination of 1300 as well to the posts. On goes the minute wheel, and then I can put on the intermediate wheel. Offering the yoke, and of course, not forgetting the yoke spring. So also adding a little bit of grease as well onto the setting lever spring and that's held in with the two screws. So just nipping that in place and then I'm just making sure that everything's engaging correctly, which it is. Now I've turned the movement back over and now I need to add on this driving wheel. Now this is also friction fit so you can use a hand press tool to press that in place. And this also was a little bit fiddly. Just making sure that it's lined up correctly as well and then I can nip up the screwdriver. Now when I first checked the watch there was quite a lot of beat error on it as well. And unfortunately with it being an older watch it needs to be manually adjusted. And the way you can do it with this nice little special tool which I would like to call a third arm is you use a very tiny screwdriver and you can just move the collet just a little bit to the left or the right, depends which way you need to go, just to adjust the bead error. That is something also that you will need to do probably two or three times. And it's pot luck basically trying to get the adjustment because you need to basically do it, put it back onto the, put the balance back onto the movement, put it on the timographer, we'll check your bead error and continue. And I think uh, I only, took me two or three times, I think, to get the beat error definitely a lot better than it was. So building up the automatic works now, I used some libretta on the reversing wheels, as you could see. Just putting in this little C-clip for the, which holds the rotor to the plate. And then I can continue building up the automatic works. Adding in the two reversing wheels, and then this central driving wheel. And then there is a final uh, bridge which will hold all of the three wheels with their pivots together. And then it will lock everything in place. I must admit, it's a nice design. I do like it. It's simple, but it works. Adding some 1300 to the jewels. And then I can offer it to the movement, making sure it's engaged correctly. I also add a little bit of wind into it. It helps it get seated correctly. And then I can screw this in place. Held in with those three screws and then just checking that everything's engaging and it is, it looks pretty damn good. So adding some oil to the top of the automatic works. Thirteen hundred onto the cannon pinion and I can offer the hour wheel as well to it before I have to dial up the watch.
So I'm just gently lowering the dial onto it. You've got two dial feed screws similar to most watches on either side of the main plate and you just nip those in place and they hold the feet securely so that the dial doesn't move. Now of course I had to remove the complete automatic works because I had to press the hands and if I did it just without removing it I could have potentially damaged the rotor so I removed the full automatic works from the movement before I press on the hands. Now hands are friction fit and there's no date on this which made things obviously quite a lot easier so I could put the hour hand on wherever I want. Then of course position it to 12 o'clock and then I can put on the minute hand. Again friction fit so you can use hand levers or you can use a hand press tool and just gently just press that into place. Continually check it as well to make sure that your hands are not touching and then once you're happy you can obviously add on your seconds hand. Same principle as well, simply just press it in place, if you can get it on that is. So I cleaned the case thoroughly in the ultrasonic machine. I ran it through twice because once it was cleaned once, I wanted to clean it again, some extra crud, and then I ran it through a second time. I also polished up the crystal as well with some Plexi Revive. There was no sanding needing for this. It just needed a good buffing by hand, which came out really, really nice. And then I can basically press on the crystal and press the bezel into place using my Bertajan crystal press tool. Now offering the case to the movement, obviously going in sideways with Rolex and then just flipping it over. And of course once it's over then I can turn the movement inside the watch case and then align it correctly so that the movement holder clamps can clamp into place correctly. Little bit of grease onto the winding stem and then I can put in a new gasket for the crown. Just adding a little bit of silicone grease to it first. Keeps it more durable and obviously makes it easier to fit as well. And then that simply just pushes into place. You can just use a pair of tweezers for this and align it. It can't go all the way through with this. There is like a, a level wall, so to speak, a thicker area where it's going to sit up snug against. And then of course I can put in the winding stem and then nip up the setting lever screw and then I know that everything is in place. Quick check. It's looking good so far. Just in the movement holder screws and then I can finally, for the third time now, put the automatic works back onto the watch. I'm also going to replace the gasket to the back of the case back because uh, the other one was completely destroyed as well. God knows how long ago it was done. So it has a brand new gasket, all siliconely greased up, so it's a lot more flexible and that should keep it good for the years to come. Now, when it comes to Rolex, it's not a straightforward procedure in regards to regulating a watch. You need to use what they call a Rolex Microstellar Adjustment Tool. And on the Rolex Balance itself, there are either two or four adjustment screws. No sir, they don't make it easy like having just a lever like on an ETA movement. They make it a pain in the ass and it was. This is a lot of trial and error. And another problem I spotted here is one of the weighted screws has been replaced which also gave me worrying about adjusting this and getting it up to a decent level of rate and of course amplitude. So after all this work with adjusting the beat error and getting the timing done, let's check it out on the timer grapher. And guys, I'm really, really happy with the end results. 0.0, .0 beat error with a high 290s amplitude coming in at plus 11. Mmm, that's mad fresh. Now we got a minus 10 with the crown down, but we still got great amplitude and obviously this is going to average out. So I'm really, really happy considering the amount of issues that we had with this, the amount of play, the beat error that I had to deal with as well. And then of course this regulation with the Microstellar tool, which is not easy with Rolex. They make it damn hard, seriously. 
I am really, really happy with how it ended up. So, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> so there we have it, guys. The Rolex Air King from 1964 with this reference 1002. Guys, if you enjoyed this video, please hit a like on it. And of course, if you have got nothing else to do, there are two more videos on the screen right now. So grab your coffee and enjoy some more watch restoration videos. And as always, guys, till next time.